Hey guys, I'm Nate Kalish. Welcome to the second episode of Hunter and Guided. Uh, we're really excited to talk to you today about one of my favorite backcountry hunting experiences. It was a super unique experience hunting muskox on Nunavik Island in Alaska. This story really starts back on draw tag day, which is essentially a state holiday. Everybody's phones are just ringing off the hook because it's a public list. You can look at all your friends online and see what tags they drew, what tags they didn't draw, things like that. I get back from a meeting that morning and my phone is just exploding with hate mail from all of my friends because this is the first year I ever put in for a muskox tag. I know people who have been putting in for this tag for 20 years and this is just my lottery ticket. After you see your name on the list, it just becomes this, oh my God, I have to figure out how logistically to get to the other side of nowhere. It's an island in between Alaska and Russia, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And it's a hunt that takes place in the winter time. So logistically speaking, it is a challenge if you're not used to traveling to Western Alaska or even further out from Western Alaska. It took about six months developing exactly how I was gonna do this. And I got in with a Chupac Eskimo transporter by the name of Abraham David. He's got a great operation there and very hospitable and you get to stay on, in Makoriuk, just a small village on Nunavik Island. When it came time to actually do the hunt, I flew from my home in Fairbanks, Alaska, routed through Anchorage. Fly from Anchorage was supposed to go to Bethel, stay in Bethel for a short period of time and then take a Cessna caravan from Bethel to Makoriuk where I would get picked up on a snow machine by my transporter. Alaska had other plans. I've got down to Anchorage, we flew out of Anchorage to Bethel. We circled over Bethel for an hour until the plane was about to run out of fuel because there was a snowstorm that came in under us and we couldn't land on their, their very small airport there in Bethel. So we had to circle back around uh, and head back to Anchorage. So day one of Dream Hunt gone because of this. I only have seven days to make this hunt a reality. We give it a shot the next day. I get from Anchorage to Bethel I know absolutely no one in Bethel, and my flight to McCorriuk is again canceled. So, day two, gone. Last leg, McCorriuk, about to get there. Day three of the hunt, we finally get out to Nunavik Island, and Abe David meets me on the, on the ru ice runway of their landing strip and says, are you ready to get your muskox? It's 45, 50 mile an hour winds, it's negative 10 to 20 fluctuating in there, it's absolutely freezing, and I'm just jacked through the roof. It's like, you have no idea how ready, I'm ready to get this done. When can we get out on the ice? He's like, well, the weather's coming in today, we're gonna have to wait another day. Okay. I go back to Abe's house and we get to hang out, and I'm, I'm like a kid, like just looking out the window every day, like, Dad, can we, can we go hunting? Can we go hunting today? Can that, can that be a thing that we do? And it just, weather after weather after weather. Weather clears up. We're now on day four or five of my seven days. It's really getting down to the wire. We started heading out west to Nash Harbor. It's about a 35 mile snow machine ride from the eastern side of the island of Macoriuk. If you've ever ridden a snow machine at 60 miles an hour into a 35 or 40 mile an hour wind at negative 11, just make sure all your skin's covered because it is absolutely miserable cold. We're going through the rolling hills of the island right along the ocean and we crest one of the hills and we come along this beautiful coastal basin with some bluffs overlooking the Bering Sea ice and it's just amazing. We stop for a second and I pull up next to, it, to Abe and this is Nash Harbor. We start going along for a little bit and I see three black dots on the horizon. I go in front of the convoy and I get in the snow machine and I'm like, stop, 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 stop. Muskox, muskox. On a transported hunt, you're not allowed to get any assistance from the transporter in the state of Alaska. There is kind of a, it's a happy medium zone between going on a guided hunt and going completely unguided. But the transporter just gets you around the island safely on Nunavak. So I've sp now spotted the muskox. It's my turn to do my job. Abe's gotten me to Nash Harbor safely consult with John, the second hunter in camp, and we get out our spotting scopes and we start looking. And I'm trying to get my eye to focus 
through my spotting scope with the freezing wind in my face and it, I've got like five second blasts of clarity before I have to rub the frozen tears out of my eyes. I'm able to do it and I look through it and I see what appears to be three bulls. And I see the first one, I see a horn boss, and this bull is ancient. It's massive, he's got gray in his face, his horn is, shat or is shattered right after the base on one side. He's just an old bruiser of a muskox. So if you're hanging out like an old biker pool hall, He's like the guy who's dying of lung cancer in the corner who's like, the gang doesn't know how to say like, hey man, you can't really ride anymore, but he's over there like, I've killed more people than you'll ever see in your life. You know, that's, he's just like the crusty old timer of the gang who doesn't really want to hang up his boots just yet, but you know, he, he still thinks he's in charge. That was this guy. I can only imagine what his meat was going to taste like. So we decided to get a closer look at these things and I tell Abe to just hang back here and me and John the Hunter and John Abe's son go around the backside of a ridge line, try and keep them in between ourselves and the ocean. Uh, the idea being that if I see one that I like and I start to make stock on it and I blow my stock and they just run, that they'll only have one direction to run, which will be straight up the mountain to John, who has a rifle. And that way, you know, my failure is his gain. So I'm trying to use much, as much as the train to my advantage as possible because there's not a lot of cover on this island in the Bering Sea. It's almost all frozen tundra. So I'm trying to come in through the low ground and I'm, I'm working my way up, I'm working my way up, I'm working my way up and next thing I know I'm, I'm in their wheelhouse and these muskox have circled the wagons. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at these things and I'm just, all right, which one is it? And then the herd bull, the old timer, the crusty guy that is the old, the old retired biker with lung cancer is just staring at me. The other two bulls are, are standing behind him. They've kind of kind of circled it up just to, so they're natural defense for predators. And the herd bull is pissed. He's just staring at me and he's just, like he's just not, he's like, I'm gonna mess you up, man. That's what he's, he's just sending off to me. At this point, I didn't know how close he actually was. I, I get out my range finder and I'm, I'm looking at him and I range him and he is 12 yards in front of me and he is mad. As I later found out on when I watched the video back, you can see John on the camera going, oh, Nate, don't get too close. Don't get too close, buddy. Huh? Get I, got, close. I got a little ambitious on it, but I, I get inside this thing's wheelhouse and he is mad, but he's not the bull I want. I've got, I go to draw a couple times, I'm, I throw caution to the wind, I'm just taking side steps. One of them breaks from the herd a little bit and I see that vital area. I'm able to make a double long shot on this bull and he goes absolutely nuts. He is shaking his head everywhere and he is pissed. So he comes back and he runs actually past the herd bull and he has to break 10 yards with me. Just shaking like, I'm like, oh, this is like, I'm gonna die here. This is, this is it, like this bull is going, to, like I killed it it's gonna kill me now. But he, he just stops and I've got another arrow drawn. I was waiting for an opportunity. I don't, I don't really know exactly where I hit him. I have a pretty good suspicion his vitals, but I, I don't want him to run off. I don't know these things capability to survive, or to survive with you know, being shot in the lungs or how long it's gonna go. So I draw back and I'm able to take another shot on him again. And he circles back around in, into the herd and he just, he dropped on the spot. After he, after he fell, the other bulls realize the severity of their situation and they turn and they run straight up the mountain just like we had planned. It was, I couldn't have scripted it better if I was writing the story myself. John's able to take a shot on a beautiful bull and we've got a Nunavik Island muskox double. I finally walk up to this animal and it's just, it's an amazing moment. It's such a cool experience to be able to think our predecessors who were surviving off nothing but nomadic hunting were seeing and hunting animals like this on the landscape. It was very, very raw and it was very humbling. There's no way that you can adequately prepare your mind for 
for one of these animals on the ground. And Abe pulls up the snow machine next to us and he comes out and you can just see the excitement on his face. He's like, good job, good job. He's just super excited. Um, they're pretty excited to see bow hunters up there. The muskox that I killed had 28 inch long hair and then at the base of the hair are these tufts of muskox wool that they call quivet. And it's just, you can't see the skin at all when you're going through these things. I broke through five or six knife blades trying to skin and bone out this animal in the field. It took me six hours to do. It was one of the, the coolest experiences of my life. To just, 12 year old me would have looked at something like that in a magazine and been like, that's insane. There's no way that's ever gonna happen. Alaska Fish and Game does a tremendous job managing these spe this species and they have since they introduced them back to Nunavik Island. In the span of 100 years, the muskox in Alaska have gone from 31 animals at the time of reintroduction to over 4,000 in the state of Alaska right now, which is about their carrying capacity at, at those units. There, there's a lot more opportunity increasing to hunt these animals. It's the hunt that got me into the outdoor industry because I got my first published article about this muskox hunt. And it's, it's something that if, if you want a real adventure on North America that's a little off the beaten path, this is one of the best opportunities. And I encourage you all to go be a part of it. Stay tuned for the next episode. It's this year's North Carolina turkey hunt and the trials and tribulations we had along the way. It was an overall great experience. I learned a lot. I became a better turkey hunter. But you also get to see that it doesn't always go the way that you plan for it to go. And it can be a stressful time, especially when you're bow hunting for turkeys. But great experience, called in some big birds. Stay tuned and check it out. Bye.